I'm so thankful for the opportunity, Pastor Robert. I know he's not here today, but so thankful for Pastor Robert and the blessing and the encouragement, the uh, fathering that he's had in my life. I praise God for Powerhouse Church, for planning me here, for bringing me here, for my kids been ra are raised here. They are sons and daughters of the house. So for me, that's just a blessing in my life. I've been saved for a while, but I think I've grown more in this house than I have the, the whole time before I ever got to Powerhouse, and I'm thankful to God for that. Amen. I'm blessed today because my son, my youngest son, I have three kids, two boys and a girl. My oldest one just about to graduate from Texas A&M Kingsville in December, so <laughs> proud dad. Got a college graduate in a couple weeks. My second, my youngest son, Caleb, he's here tonight. He's actually serving with the Texas National Guard, the Army. So the Lord worked it out just great that he actually is, is on leave. And uh, they let him loose to come up to be with the old man. and Well, not really the old man, but the girlfriend, really. That's really what they came to, you know. I'm just an afterthought. But I praise God that his protection is on my sons, on my daughter, and that he's able to be here tonight. So I thank God for that. I do a lot of ministry when it comes to fathers and sons. And I know that there are a lot of ministers who kind of have a niche and they kind of teach on something over and over. And that's kind of like their niche. For me, something that, that makes my heart move and glad and I get excited about is just the whole father-son relationship. Now, it's kind of odd because I grew up without a dad. I shared that with you last time. I grew up without a father. There have been father figures in my life, but overall, no dad. So when my sons came along, because I actually had their names picked before I even got married, I already knew what I was going to name my son. That was Joshua and Caleb, men of faith, men who followed after God. So I had their names picked out. And when I was talking before we got married, my wife, and I said, I'm going to name my sons Joshua and Caleb. She says, I'm for it. Let's do it, you know. And I said, okay, you're the one. I want to marry you. Hey, that's, that's what we're going to do. So I talk about fathers and sons. It's just something that God shows me in our relationship, with my relationship with him. It's a father-son relationship. And he, he, he just reveals things to me that way. I guess that's just the avenue that, that makes me tick. That's the button to push with me. Now, I love my daughter with all my heart. And she is just as important as my sons. Today I'm going to talk about my sons. But I want to share a story about my daughter. Now, my daughter's 10 years old. Okay? There is a 10-year difference between my youngest son and my daughter. She was a late surprise, a blessing, a late blessing, no surprises, a late blessing in my life. But I'm 54 years old. I'll be 55 in March. And I don't know about you guys, but... I'm a little bit more stiff in my older age. I don't bend as easy. I'm not as flexible. So our sink got clogged, our kitchen sink. So I really didn't want to pay a plumber. So I said, I'm going to do this myself. Now, I, it's been a while since I got down underneath the kitchen sink. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, how, but hey, my, my body doesn't bend as easily and it's not as flexible. So we were down there. And actually, I was sitting in a little stool trying to get in there. And my 10-year-old daughter came, and she helped her dad out. And she got up on, inside that sink. And she got the pliers, and we have a plug on the wall, you know. And she undid that thing. And then me and her ran a cable down that, that, that hole to try to bust that thing up. We ran like 20 foot of cable down in there, right? And, uh, man, my daughter just was a blessing because there she was, a 10-year-old girl. And she was with her daddy. And we were plumbing. Man, what a blessing that was. So Abigail, Elizabeth, if you're listening, Dad loves you. You are a blessing to your father. Malachi 4, 6. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. We are all men here this evening. Some of us are fathers. Some of us will be fathers one day, and maybe some may not. But we are all sons in this house. We are all sons. 
If you're here today, you're a man, you are a son, you are somebody's son. Now, I hope you hear the message today and apply God's word to your life, either as a father or as a son, but definitely as a man. As my sons were growing up, I tried to get them involved in many different things. Church activities, sports, band, academic clubs, and Boy Scouts, okay? Because I believe that if you keep, you have to keep boys busy. If you don't keep a boy busy, he will find something to be busy about. The last thing you want is for a boy to decide what he's going to be busy about. I'm an educator. I'm an assistant principal. We do not want our boys trying to find things to be busy about on their own. We are dads. We will direct the things that we know they should be busy about. And we are going to guide our sons in that, in that area. So that is something as a father, that's what I do. So... Growing up, I wanted my boys to be busy. We're going to be doing stuff, and I was right there with them. One of the benefits about being an educator is that in the summers, uh, I'm off a couple weeks, a few weeks, about four or five weeks, I get off. And uh, one thing that we do is we go to Boy Scout camp in the summers. And I was able to go as an assistant scoutmaster. I would go with my sons to Boy Scout camp and um, be there with them. So when you go to camp, the boys would go, and all day long, they would go to merit badge classes. They would have different activities, uh, shooting, archery, canoeing, water sports. I mean, they were busy from the time they woke up to the time they went to bed. They had them busy. They had them doing things. Now, as an assistant scoutmaster, I, too, would go to camp Usually on the first day, I would walk around camp. I would check in on the boys. I would look at the camp, see what they had to offer, maybe take a class or two. But the most important thing I did as an assistant scoutmaster, especially in the Texas summer. How many of you have ever been camping before? You have been in tents, you've been camping, right? How many of y'all have been camping in Texas? How many of y'all have been camping in Texas in July? In a tent. No RV. RV isn't cheating. I'm talking about a tent. So we would go. I don't have that first picture up. So we would go camping. There's my son Caleb. So this is the kind of tent you would sleep in, okay? It was hot. So one of the things that, as a scoutmaster, the most important thing that I did was to take a nap. That's what I did. They went to class. I took a nap because I was an assistant scoutmaster, and that's what we had to do. That was part of my job was to take a nap. So the boys would go do their activities. I would stay home or stay home or stay in the camp, take a nap, make sure the tent didn't blow away, you know, the important stuff. Well, one summer, let me show that second one. One summer, my son goes ahead and, you know, they have different merit badges. It's him. You shoot getting the, the, the rifle merit badge of that one. But one summer he decided to do the shotgun merit badge. Now, when you do the shotgun merit badge, you know, part of the, the, the requirements for, for earning the merit badge is one, you had to know gun safety. That's a big plus. They don't want, they don't want Boy Scouts hurting each other. They, they learn the parts of a gun. But also, there was a practical application. You had to know how to shoot the gun. And one of the things was that you had to shoot 12 out of 25 targets, and you had to do it two times, okay? Now, my son gets up there, and it's time to go, okay? And he, he does it. He does the first one. He goes up there, and, and he shoots, and he, he gets them. He does it the first time. But you got to do it two times in order to qualify and, get that, and earn that badge. So then he goes, and he, he attempts it either two or three more times. So I'm, I'm, at, I'm, at, uh, I'm at camp, and, and, and I'm doing the important thing at camp. I'm taking a nap. I'm chilled. It's hot in the summer. It's hot, 100 degrees. It doesn't matter. I'm chilled. I'm, I'm doing a, a scout, assistant scoutmaster's thing. And Caleb, he comes after the American. You know, he's at class, and I'm at camp, and he comes back. And I said, Caleb, how'd it go? 
And Caleb comes up to me and he says, Dad. He says, Dad, will you come with me next time? Will you be there when I try again? At that moment, my heart was turned to my son. It turned to my son. Because at that moment, my son's heart had turned to me. He said, Dad, will you be there? Will you come with me next time? Will you be there when I try again? At that moment, I hurt the heart of my son. It was turned to my, his dad. Now, there's something powerful when a son cries out for his dad. I heard the heart cry of my son. Now, Caleb wasn't crying. He wasn't sobbing. There were no tears running down his face. But there's something when a son cries out for his father. There is something when the children of God, God's children, cry out, Abba, Father. In our alone time, our hearts cry out to God. When his kids are calling out, they are seeking his face. And God turns to us and he says, here I am, son. Here I am. You see, we have a curse in society today. Too many sons and daughters are crying out for a father. They're crying out for a dad, and there is no answer. We have abandoned children. We have abandoned children who are being raised in decapitated families. Growing up fatherless, trying to figure out life on their own. They have no direction. They have no guidance, no discipline that's based in love. They grow hard, no sense of right and wrong. They make wrong choices that carry severe consequences. They end up lost, addicted, in prison, hopeless, self-centered, used and abused. And the list goes on and on and on because there is no father to listen when their heart cries out. Mark 37, 40, it gives the account of Jesus. And Jesus is in the boat. He's asleep. And a storm comes. And there's thunder, the clap of thunder. And there's lightning. And the wind is blowing. And the rain is pelting him. And what's Jesus doing? He's asleep. He's chilled, just like me at camp. He's asleep. He's asleep. Just like me. I was at camp. I was chill. But then Jesus heard something. And it was different than the thunder. It was different than the lightning. It was different than the waves, the boat rocking, the wind, the, 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 um, the rain hitting. He heard something that wasn't right. Jesus. And Jesus hears it. The storm didn't wake him up. What woke him up? The voice of his children, the voice of his son. At that moment when Caleb came and said, Dad, will you be there? Will you come with me? Will you be there next time I try? Something in my heart stirred, and it moved me to get up. It moved me to get up. And I looked him in the eye, and I heard, and I looked in his eye, and I knew something was wrong. Something didn't sound right to this dad. There was something that my son said that didn't set right in me as a father. I heard fear. I heard doubt. I heard, Dad, am I able? Can I do this? Something didn't sound right to this dad. And, I had a, and it moved me to say, mm -mm, I got to fix this. This is my son. See, it has nothing to do with a merit badge. It has to do with my son. Because one day my son will get a job and he'll go to work and the pressures of life will get hard. And there's quotas and there's deadlines and the boss might be a jerk. But what's my son going to do? Is he going to say, I'm not going back there. I'm not going to go try again. I'm just going to up and leave. Will he give a good day's work? Will he give an honest day's work or will he call in sick repeatedly? 
Or will he go to work and just fiddle around in the back? You know those guys. No, not my son. As long as I'm a dad, as long as he's my son, I'm going to train my son that when life gets hard, son, and, and there's lions and bears, you got to overcome them because you got to go to work, son. Because if a man don't work, we're going to have problems. You're going to have problems. See, when the stresses of marriage get great, they will. I'm married 26, 27 years. I won't be 27 years. They're great. You know what? I can't let him walk away from that gun range. He got to go back. He's got to go back. You have to go back and shoot again. I can't let him walk away. I can't let that fear and doubt overcome him because it, it's going to have a negative impact in his spiritual and his natural life if I allow that seed to stay in planted and it grow in him. But as his dad, I am going to work on my son. Because when he gets married and life gets tough, the car breaks down, the kid gets sick, the, the sink gets clogged. Will he blame his wife? Will he turn on his wife as a source of the problems? Will he find someone else instead? Will he just abandon his family? Or will he seek relief in an addiction to get through the pressures of life? I can't let that seed stay there. I got to uproot what I heard that wasn't right. It woke Jesus up and said, no, uh-uh. Let me show you what to do. In the Bible, the word said, Mark 1.11. Dad, can you come with me? Will you be there when I try again? Mark 1.11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus woke up. Peace, be still. Number one, folks, gentlemen, number one, a son needs to hear his father's voice. My son came to me because he needed to hear his father's voice. So my son comes. So there's something in my family or something with me that I learned from here, and then I apply in my family. I said, okay, I hear something. I see something. So now I'm going to speak to my son. I said, you look me in the eye. You look into my heart, and I'm going to look into yours. A, a son needs to hear the voice of his father. I shared this with you last time. I'm going to share it again. There are three things every boy needs to hear from his dad. Number one, I love you. I'm proud of you. You have what it takes to overcome. You have it in you. God has instilled it in you to do whatever it is you need to do. Whatever lion comes your way, you can kill it, son. Whatever bear, because tomorrow the giant's over there, and we're going to take him out too. <laughs> when you speak life, be specific. Use scripture. Let it flow from your heart. Son, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. All things are possible. You are more than a conqueror. Yes, today it's a shotgun marriage badge, but tomorrow it might be your job. It might be your, your, your marriage, but we can overcome. You can overcome in the name of Jesus. A son needs to hear his father's voice. So as fathers, we need to speak to our sons. We need to speak life. We need to affirm our sons. And some of us are fathers here today. Some of us will be fathers. Some of us maybe not, but one thing today is we are all sons. As a son, in, in, when life gets tough, you need to listen to the voice of our Father in heaven. You need to allow his voice to penetrate your heart and understand that no matter what you're going through, our Father in heaven has an answer for you to overcome. Dad, can you come with me? Will you be there when I try again? Genesis 21.4 and Acts 
A son needs a father to cut away things that don't belong. Spiritual circumcision. Genesis 21 4 talks about Abraham circumcising Isaac. Acts 16 3, Paul circumcises Timothy. Now, Abraham and Isaac were a natural father to son. Paul and Timothy was a spiritual father and son. It was the responsibility of the father to circumcise his son. Now, for those of y'all, when it comes to circumcision in the covenant, there was a time they had to take the male organ and cut away something in order to fulfill the covenant with God. In our lives, it is a father's job initially to cut away those things in my son's life that don't belong. And you have to be delicate when you circumcise, dads. You have to be delicate because you are dealing with the reproductive organ of your son. We are not butchers cutting up steaks. We are surgeons delicately cutting away to bring healing to the body. There are times, and many of us may have experiences growing up, where your dad was a butcher. And he might have said some things to you that tore you apart. And maybe today you are, you are carrying those things. Like I talked last time, they were passed down to you and you caught them. Because maybe in your life, your dad was a difficult man, a hard man, not a spiritual, a loving man. And he used a butcher knife to, to raise you up. Whether it was intentional, malicious, or he just didn't know any better, the results are the same. It was a butcher knife that he went to, to town on you with. When we talk to our sons, when we talk to our kids, our daughters, we need to be like a surgeon with a scalpel to begin to cut away those things that are not pleasing to God, that don't belong. Because we do not want to damage the reproductiveness of our kids. I do not want my sons not to serve God because of something I did, something I said, something how I handled them and, 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 and abused them or whatever the case may be. I am not perfect. My son can attest to you today how imperfect I am. But I purpose in my heart to raise my kids up to serve the Lord. So I'm going to take out a scalpel to cut away those things in my kids that don't belong, to cut away the fear, the doubt. So we begin to talk. I begin to make an adjustment with my son. Now, when my son comes to talk to me, he's not coming to talk to me because I'm some type of shotgun expert, okay? My son did not come to talk to me or come to say, Dad, because we are going to work on how to hold a shotgun, you know, or up here, how you're standing, or, or are you looking down, you got the wrong eye open. No. I've been, I've been bird hunting with some of you guys. I've been dove hunting with Pastor Robert. They can attest that I'm no shotgun expert. So when my son comes to me, he's not coming to look for shotgun advice from your father. He knows his dad is not an expert when it comes to shotgun. That's what the range master is for. That's the instructor. But he comes to his son and he comes to his dad because I am an expert in Caleb. I am an expert in my son. I know my son. What my son wanted to know is if he was able Dad, can I do this? Do I have it in me, Dad? Am I enough? That was his heart's cry. That's what he was asking me. As his father, it is my responsibility to cut away those things that have a negative impact on my son. The fear, the doubt, the worry. As a dad, I have to build a man. Son, this is how you love your wife. Love gives at the expense of self. Son, this is how you guard your family. This is what a good work ethic looks like, son. Watch me as I get up early and I go to work. 
I am raising a son and building men. Dad, can you come with me? Will you be there when I try again? Exodus 33, 15. God and Moses are talking. And God is telling Moses, hey, Moses, you're going to lead the people into the promised land. And I'm sure Moses had his doubts. That's 600,000 men that he's going to have to lead out with their families. And Moses says something to God. If your presence doesn't not go with us, do not bring us up out of here. He said, God, you, can you come with me? Will you be there when I try? And God says, I'll be there with you. Dad, will you be there next time? So it's time to come. I talked to my son. He's heard my voice. I've worked on those things in his life. Okay, son. You are able. You got this. You can do this. I speak to his life. I speak to his heart. But now it's time to go do it. Because you can listen and you can, you can talk about it. But God's plan is that you go do it. So we walk to the gun range together. And we enter the gun. Well, we, we get there. And now, I'm not allowed to go in. I had to sit on the outside. So we got that picture there. So hit the next one, and then we'll come back to that one. Let's see, one more. Or is that it? Yeah, that's me. There, there I am right there. Okay? So I have to sit down on the outside. I'm not allowed inside. I have to wait outside. The Boy Scouts are very strict when it comes to safety. So I have to sit on the outside. I am not allowed in the waiting area for the participants who are about to shoot. So I'm waiting on the outside. So we'll go back to. We'll go back to would be great. There we go. Thank you, sir. Appreciate y'all back there. So he goes in and he sits. I can tell he's nervous. I can see him thinking and he's tapping. Eventually, it's time for him to shoot, and they call him up. Next. So he gets up, and as he's getting up, he looks me in the eye. Now, I can't talk to him. We look at the eye, and I give him a nod. Sometimes a father's affirmation is not verbal. It's a look. It's a pat on the back, a slap on the rear end, whatever it is. But the message is still the same. I got you, son. I got you, son. I'm here with you. You're not alone. Your data has your back. I'm calling out your name before the throne of God. I'm your dad. I'm going to help you through this. Then he goes in. And that's that little one right back there. I'm here, the waiting area, and there he is. He's alone. I'm not there anymore. He is standing on his own. See, my, my son found strength and confidence in the presence of his father. A son needs his father's presence. When you listen to the voice of our Father who art in heaven and you allow God to cut away those things in your life revealed to you by the word of God and you seek God's presence, you can overcome anything that the enemy tries that brings against, that brings against you. You can overcome. Caleb's heart, Caleb goes in there and he does it. He gets it. He hits the 12 out of 25. He got it. He earns the merit badge. And I'm proud of my son. But I'm not proud of my son because of a merit badge. Because a merit badge does not define who my son is. 
He knows who he is, and he knows whose he is. He is my son. He belongs to me. But not only that, he knows who he is, and he knows whose he is. Because there's going to come times in his life when he's got to go and he's got to stand alone. And his natural father will not be there. But when he goes and he stands alone, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that will stand right there with him. No matter what comes his way, he can stand because it's the power of God that will allow him to stand firm no matter what comes his way. That's what I teach my sons. I teach them. I got a model from them. And I got a model, Lord, forgive me for messing up. Lord, forgive me for not being perfect. Son, forgive me for, not, for letting you down, for not being perfect. But I purpose in my heart that I'm going to keep going forward and I'm going to get better and better and be the godly father God has called me to be. Caleb turned to me because, as his dad, my heart had turned to him a long time ago. And I laid the groundwork before this day ever came. I had to learn, and I'm still learning how to be a godly father, a dad. My son needs the voice of the father in him. So when the time comes to stand alone, he won't need the physical dad. He will have the inward presence of his father and his word inside of him. Gentlemen, who is, your, who is your heart turned to today? Two things. As a dad, as a dad, are you listening to those things that don't belong in the lives of your children? Are you looking for those things that don't belong in their lives? Are you speaking life to your kids? Are you cutting away those things that don't belong, not with a butcher knife, but with a fine scalpel? Do your kids draw strength from your presence as a dad, as a son? Because we're all sons here today. Who is listening to you when you cry out? Who is looking through you? Who speaks life into you? Who cuts away those things that don't belong in your life? Where do you draw strength? It's tough. It's rough. It's not easy. The first part is just to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Allow God to begin to speak into your life. Allow the word of God to cut away those things that don't belong. And then be in the presence of God. Allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen you, to fill you full of power, to fill you full of the presence of God. Let's stand this evening. Father God, I thank you for I thank you for your word. I thank you for teaching me how to be a dad, a godly father, a godly man, a godly husband. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Gentlemen, tonight the first step is just knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you've never made that happen, I give you the opportunity to accept Christ into your life. It is the best decision I've ever made. It turned my life around. If that's you tonight, the altar is open. I invite you to come.